Well, welcome to St Andrew's Online as we gather again uh, in different people's homes uh, around the world as we've come to worship on a day which probably isn't so great outside in terms of weather. It's a bit rainy around here, but um, wherever you are, I hope you can uh, enjoy being with us as we gather online together. And as Simon just mentioned, it's great to see that people are joining us from different places around the world. We know that one week we had people joining us from Australia. If you're joining us from different places in the, in the UK or from um, countries in, around the world, then do let us know in the chat. We'd love to hear where you're from as the service goes on today. And during our service, we're going to uh, take communion together today. So do get some, some bread and some juice or some wine so that you can join in with taking communion as the service progresses. We're now going to worship together as we sing this next song. Do join in. Well, good morning, St Andrews. It's fantastic to be with you online. Let's just spend some time now, just before we worship, just giving our lives, our weeks to God. What's been going on? What's been good? What's been bad? What's just been ugly? <laughs> And knowing that in all things, no matter what it is that we're going through right now, God is there in our midst.
make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 let's just sing that again, that is who you that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Yes, you are. We make a miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yes, you are. We make a miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. So it's great to know that whilst we're meeting online, that the children and the young people have also been meeting up online. Some are meeting at the moment, but also meeting at different times throughout the week as well for different things that they're doing. And over the Easter holidays, the children were set a challenge to build a house using no building blocks, but they could use what other materials they wish to use. And we're just going to have a look at those entries that, that they um, sent in their pictures of their houses. The first is one by Elsbeth of her cat's house. And I love the way that her cat is in the house. So her cat actually really loves that house. You can see the cat enjoying it. I hope the cat's still enjoying that house, El Elsbeth. Well done. And then an Avengers house with lovely shiny windows that James has um, created with rooms for all the superheroes. So in those shiny windows, I think there's pictures of, of superheroes there in the windows. So that's fantastic effort. And Merrin has built a luxury pad. Look at that. You've got a swimming pool in the garden. There's a, a chimney on the roof and it looks a very um, modern design there. Fantastic luxury pad by Merrin. Very clever. Very good. And then Mr. Bear's beach house. Candice has created this with a lot of help from Mummy. You can actually see the bears. They're enjoying their beach house. Fantastic, really colourful um, design there. Very creative, isn't it? Very good. And a mansion by Ellie. Now, if you look in the corner of this picture, you can see a cupboard, so you can see how huge this house is that, that Ellie has made. Ellie, that's a fantastic house. Um, I hope you can go inside it and enjoy being in, in your mansion. It looks great. So they all were winners, so well done to those uh, children who made those beautiful uh, buildings that are out of all sorts of stuff from things in the home. Very creative. Very creative. Yeah. Today what we're doing as a church, our theme really, is looking at pe uh, prayer and the power of prayer mm -hmm. and how God is at work in our lives as he amazingly chooses to partner with us. And so I thought as we be we'd begin with a story from Louise about God working in her life and in her family's life. So let's watch this. Hi everybody at St Andrews, my name is Louise and I'd just like to share with you how God's been providing for our family. My husband is a self-employed electrician and he did some work back in January for an organisation. A uh, few hours here and there, so he invoiced all the work that he did and was meant to be paid in January. He wasn't paid in January and became quite irritated and annoyed about it. He rang the organisation on a number of occasions and they had different excuses of why they couldn't pay him. So I really started to pray into it and just felt a real peace with God. And God said to me, don't worry, the money will come in a bulk lump sum when you need it. So fast forward now to the weekend of lockdown. So I think it was the 20th of March. My husband, the site my husband was running closed down due to the coronavirus. So because he's self-employed, we didn't really have any backup. So thank God he actually started another job last week. But through this whole period of time, we haven't had his wage coming in. And we're coming up to the time when our mortgage and bills are due to come out. So he said to me last week, can you just go on to the uh, mortgage website and apply for the mortgage holiday online? So I went on, but whilst I was on applying for the mortgage holiday, I just felt prompted to come off of there and exit out of it and to just trust in God. So I exited out of it and I prayed into the situation again and just left it with God and said, I, I trust in you, Lord. So the mortgage was due out two or three days before the mortgage due, was due out last Monday. All of that money that was expected in January was paid into our account ready for our mortgage and bills so we're just so thankful to God for that 
And when we were praying again as a family afterwards, I just felt God say to me, if you'd have had that money in January, you would have spent it unnecessarily. So I just think God has always, no matter how we're feeling about something, God has always got our best interests at heart and his timing is always right. Amen. Well, thank you for that story, Louise. It's great to hear stories of what God is doing at the moment. And we'd just like to encourage you that if you have a God story, please let us know something that God is doing at the moment or has done at the moment that would encourage us as we all journey through this time together. We're going to um, be inviting you to join in with a quiz. I don't know whether you're finding, you know, sometimes you're thinking, what, what, what fun things could we do at the moment? And uh, Michael and Caroline from uh, St. Mary's and St. George's Church, our partner church at the other side of, of the town, are putting together a quiz night um, on Friday the 7th of uh, May. Actually, mm -hmm. I think it might be the 8th. Friday the 8th of May. And... Um, they're inviting us to join in so if you would like to do that information about that will come up now on the screen and also went out on the email that we sent out this week and uh, the other thing we just want to say thank you to those who are giving to support the life of the church particularly financially uh, to enable us to support our community and to continue to do what God is calling us to and uh, we'd often have an offering as part of our uh, gathering together and the way we're doing this online is through text particularly or through the website and again on the screen you can see how you can do that to continue to support the life of the church so do do that now or throughout this time as we're gathered together we're very aware that at this time um, how uh, the coronavirus is affecting us in different countries is, is different and uh, we want to keep up with our mission partners mm. from around the world and see how they're doing. So this week Simon was um, in contact with the Sekia family in Ethiopia and uh, we're going to hear from them now how they're getting on at this time. Good morning, it's uh, 5 a.m. in Ethiopia and you can hear the dawn chorus of birds uh, starting off and that's the church, the Orthodox Church, just over the river from us that you hear in the background there. They've been praising and worshipping since 4 a.m., actually before 4 a.m. this morning. It's a quarter past six and the worship is still going. These guys have some real worship stamina. We'd just love to give you an update as a family where we're up to at this time of difficulty for so many people in the world and also on ministry things. We've spent the last few weeks supporting people in the best way we know how, um, including those who've been leaving, so helping them with practical things. Um, I'm also still supporting about 10 missionaries that are still here. Um, I run the Bible study groups now on Zoom. Um, and. We've been looking after the affairs of an additional four households while they're away. I also still provide contingency information, which is now, uh, is now more information about coronavirus through a WhatsApp group. And I sit on the crisis management team at SIL. In addition to that, we've really tried to help out our Ethiopian friends here by providing funds for them and um, being a conduit for others uh, so that they can provide funds for Ethiopians to stock up. We've been at home for five weeks now. I've been primarily involved in homeschooling the kids. I've also been preparing some videos for some of our projects to advertise uh, what we've been doing. There are 67 active Bible translation projects around the country, mostly isolated now with the uh, coronavirus lockdown in place. And I've also recently published a contemporary Ethiopian novel on the issues of homelessness and mental illness. This is Shinani at her workstation, working on IGCCs this year. Amalia has recently discovered the joy of reading chapter books. So here she is snuggled up in bed, reading a very exciting story. So Leora, how's online schooling been for you? Yeah, it's weird and it's different, but I really like being at home. And how's things with friends? Um, well, all of my friends have pretty much left, so it's kind of weird. This is Renate at her workstation, working on her grade 5 assignments. Slaving away today. We love you, St. Andrews. Andrews! So 
So it's great to hear from the Sekia family and um, I just want to encourage you to pray for them mm. and also to pray for other people that you know in different places around the world at this time. We're now going to uh, listen to Simon as Simon is going to speak to us about uh, the posture of prayer. Well, I discovered an interesting thing this week about the word prayer. Uh, it derives from the Latin word precarious. And we pray because life is precarious. Precarious means dependent on chance circumstances or unknown conditions or uncertain developments. And it's characterised by a lack of security or stability. I don't know about you, but our world feels precarious at this moment. With a deadly hidden virus and a fragile economy and uncertain work conditions and fear seeming to stalk the footpaths in the parks and the shops. And when life seems precarious, even those who don't prescribe to any faith seek help, it seems, in some kind of prayer. The Canadian psychologist David Benner describes prayer as the soul's native language. For many people who turn to prayer, it's even those who don't have any religious devotion, such as uh, Abraham Lincoln admitted he said, I have been driven to my knees many times by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom seemed insufficient for that day. So it's interesting that despite living in a more and more secularised country as the UK is, people seem to be turning to God in these precarious times to pray. Think of uh, the medical profession for those who are working in extremely risky and pressured environments. You may have seen on the news someone called David Knott is a, a trauma surgeon. He's been interviewed by a number of uh, different people and he is someone who spends a number of weeks each year uh, in these uh, really tough uh, conflict zones. Uh, such as Afghanistan or Yemen or Congo or Syria. Uh, and at the moment he's in London uh, applying what he's learnt in these war zones to treating patients of COVID-19. And this is what he said. He said, I'm not particularly religious, but it's interesting. When you're in such a dreadful situation and when you realise that your life may be coming to an end very rapidly, and the situation is such that the stress is so much you need to turn to somebody. He says, who do you turn to? He says, I feel I am able to talk to God. So I do feel that he is listening to me and he's listening to my severe anxieties at the time. And it gives me enormous comfort to realise that I am talking to him and that he's given me some strength back. It's a very odd, odd experience, but, but that's getting close to God. So whether you've been someone who has been a follower of Jesus for many years and taught to God regularly, or, or whether through these precarious times you're seeking to pray, it seems it, it's not so much the question of why we pray, but how then do we pray? And over the next few weeks, we're going to have a series entitled Just Pray. And this will lead us up to Pentecost at the end of May. And I really encourage you, if you've not yet got hold of this book called How to Pray by Pete Gregg. If you can get that and order that online through the St Andrew's Bookshop or other places, it would be great if you could read that book. It really is helpful. And today what I want us to uh, focus on is the posture of prayer and the summary of what I want to say today is this it says that I choose to pray as part of the people of God in a posture of humility and that phrase is taken from a passage in the Old Testament which is our reading for this morning if you've got a Bible uh, either a phone or a tablet uh, it's in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 6 and chapter 7 and Solomon, King Solomon, in this story, 
has just built this great big temple uh, and he wants to dedicate it to God. So he prays in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, this wonderful prayer dedicating all that they have done to God. And as we turn into 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we see God's answer to this prayer that Solomon has prayed. And it's always a good question to ask, what is it that God has got to say? So we're going to listen to this reading now from Mark Britton as he reads it to us. Good morning. The reading is taken from 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verses 1 to 3 and 11 to 15. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, his love endures forever. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do with the temple of the Lord and his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Well, that was a, an amazing reading where fire comes down from heaven, consumes the sacrifices they've put before God and God's presence so fills the temple that people go, whoa! I can't stand this, it's just so amazing. And they fall before God on the pavement and worship. And then later on in the story, we see that God appears to Solomon. And I want to focus on this part of the passage. It's in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 13 onwards, where God says that when things come your way that maybe you don't understand, when natural disasters threaten to overwhelm you, this is what God says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. It's something you may have heard before. It's quite a, a well-known passage from Scripture. And it's so rich that what I want to do is to, over the next two weeks, break this uh, little verse down to two sections to dig deep into what God says to us. So this week, just as we begin, it begins with a word, just one word, which says, If, if my people will humble themselves and pray. Now, I have to be honest, I'm a rubbish prayer. Now, you probably shouldn't think that a vicar would say that, but I just find prayer so hard. Maybe you can relate to that as well. Uh, when we think of prayer or my lack of it, it's not that we don't want to. It's not that we don't see prayer does make a difference. I think for many of us in this switched on digital world, the biggest problem is distraction. Something comes in or something around us, particularly this amazing thing here is a wonderful thing, this smartphone, but it's such a distraction. T.S. Eliot, who I don't pretend to understand much of his poetry or even read it, he wrote this, I think ahead of his time, about this twittering world. He said where people are Distracted from distraction by distraction. 
If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. If. In a great book that uh, I've been reading, and also the team have been reading, called uh, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. In this book, he digs a, di a bit deeper into this distraction, and particularly those things that come into our spiritual life. He says this, he says, some of the most sincere and honest people I know tell me that when they get into the presence of God, they just can't pay attention. They're distracted. I can relate to that. So when, as I try to do each morning, I sit down to be with God and to pray, to maybe read my Bible on my iPad, I get out the Bible in one year out, which I, I love to do, even though I'm a few months behind now. But when I pick it up, I, I see an, oh, as an email needs my attention or, or I check what's happening in the news that's been happening overnight. Or I see that it's my move on the chess match I'm playing with my son in Australia. Or I even on my phone, I look at my Fitbit app to see how my sleep score has been. Or I see all these notifications on Facebook, all these things which are distractions. The Bible says if. It's a decision we have to choose to push through those distractions. And I don't just mean on that once a day time where we set aside to prayer. That's only the time that we hear God speak or we pray. It's wherever you are. The Apostle Paul puts it so well in Romans 12. And this is what he says. This is the message version. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, going to work, walking around or now lock in and place it before God as an offering. You see, when we choose to part with God, to pray and to listen and to join in, it's, it's in that place that he answers us. I want to just share with you a, a story I came across when we did the prayer course last term as part of our small group. It's just a, a couple of ordinary people who, uh, this guy travels into London uh, each day for his work. And as he would say himself, it's not an amazing prayer, uh, but he tells this story uh, of one day a year or so ago uh, of following God's promptings and his wife as well and see what it is that God does. Let's just listen to their story. We want to tell you about an incident that happened to us about 15, 16 months ago. One morning, as normal, I went into London, but instead of going to Canary Wharf, as I, where I normally worked, I had a meeting first thing in Westminster. So I walked from Waterloo towards Westminster. And just as I was going past the County Hall uh, Hotel, I had this sense that there was something wrong. It just felt oppressive and, and dark. And so I thought I'd pray. And as I prayed, I remembered that there'd been a horrible terrorist incident uh, a year or so earlier where a number of people had died. And so I prayed for protection for people against something like that happening again. And I walked and I walked and I walked. I had plenty of time. I walked all around Westminster, past the Abbey that has a Parliament, Parliament Square, um, past some of the big uh, government offices, praying for everybody I could think of for protection, safety, and that nothing bad would happen. And after an hour, I was prayed out. I, I had enough. So I went and had a coffee and I was sitting reading the news um, and suddenly some police cars, a whole trail of them went past flashing and, and sirens blazing. And I noticed on the BBC website, breaking news, terrorist incident in, in Westminster. Um, I was a bit taken aback. I was right where I was. And I thought, oh, better tell Linda that I'm OK. So I called her. Fortunately, the lines were all clear and I was able to call what what did you feel? Perhaps what happened even before that? Well, I had been up earlier than your call. I had been up since 4.30. I'm not an early morning person, but I felt God wake me at 4.30 and ask me to pray, and particularly for protection for Jonathan on his way to work. And it's not something that I would normally do. I don't wouldn't normally wake at 4.30, particularly to pray. And um, I just felt it was odd because I thought he was going to Canary Wharf. I didn't know he'd be in Westminster. And I didn't know he would need protection on the way to work, but I still prayed anyway. And um, I didn't know any of this was unfolding until I got a call from Jonathan. 
and you know, as as it happened, I think two people ended up in hospital. Uh, a number of people were slightly hurt, but there was even an ambulance riding immediately behind a, a trail of cyclists who were hit by the, 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 the driver. And the driver had apparently been driving around Westminster since I think six that morning. I got there about half past six. Um, and he was there driving around just as I was praying. And somehow God had cho asked me to pray with him and to partner with me to protect people in that area. I don't know who else was there praying, uh, but somehow I realised that my prayers made a difference uh, and that God was actually calling me to work with him to make a difference in our world. And that really challenged me. Hmm. I think it, like, again, for me, it's challenged my own prayer life and that I realised that my prayers, my personal prayers make a difference and that God occasionally calls us to, to pray and to, and to intervene. And we... He, we, we pray, we're obedient and we pray, um, sometimes not even knowing the outcome that's going to happen. But, you know, God asked me to pray and he wanted me to partner with him, to have this connection with him. And, you know, I prayed and, um, you know, I think that he protected you through that. So for me, it's, it's, it's made me realise that, that my prayers matter. Um, and that's what God wants. He wants us to, that connection with him. Isn't that a great story? It says, you know, if I choose to pray, and I love the fact that it was both the husband and wife in a sense of partnership praying and God broke into that situation. I must choose to pray. And as we move into the verse, it says, if my people who are called by my name, my people, we join with millions, billions of Christians around the world when we pray. We are part of a worldwide family. Now, in the West, what we tend to do is to think of me and my relationship with God, individualism. It's not how Jesus designed the church or how we should pray. Indeed, when Jesus was asked, how is it that I should pray? He doesn't say, my Father in heaven. He says, our Father who art in heaven. He doesn't say, don't lead me not into temptation. He says, lead us not into temptation. He says, deliver us from evil. It's always more than just one. It's the church. It's those I'm called into community with. And what's been good is during this time of locked down or being locked away from people that so many in St Andrews have been following the daily emails, the daily devotionals, which in one sense, even though we're separate, we are joining together as we pray through the same thing. And I've come also across a, a recent initiative which is gathering momentum at this time. And it's based exactly on these words, this passage from 2 Chronicles 7.14. And it's something where we can join with millions around the world, a prayer initiative. And uh, I just want to invite you to listen to Pete Gregg, who heads up 24-7 Prayer, explain what it is. And maybe you can join in with this simple way of praying with the worldwide church. If my people who are called to pray. Let's watch this. Sammy and I wanted to reach out to you from our home to yours because we're sensing it's time to sound the trumpet and call the 24-7 tribes to get behind a prayer initiative called Unite 714. You probably know 2 Chronicles 714. It's when God promises that if we'll just humble ourselves and turn to him in prayer, he'll forgive our sins and heal our land. The model is really simple. Just pause to pray each day at 7.14 a.m. and 7.14 p.m. in unison with millions around the world. That's twice a day, one voice. We've been praying non-stop for 20 years and this is our biggest challenge yet. God's been preparing us. He's positioned us as a movement for this moment and the model we're going to use is Unite 714. Together, let's cry out to God for the healing of our lands from coronavirus and a spiritual awakening in our time. Do you know, I've been praying that way, 7.14 a.m. and 7.14 p.m. for about five days now. And it's very simple. We know it's unifying and I believe it's powerful. 
Uh, there's resources you can use to help you pray just for that minute, or you can just pray wherever you are. It's if my people, who are called by my name, goes on to say if they humble themselves and pray. It's a posture of humility. And when Jesus teaches us about prayer again and again, what he's saying is, you know, don't try and impress God. Keep it simple. In the prayer course, some of the best advice that I heard was this. It's keep it simple, keep it real and keep it up. So good. Keep it simple, keep it real and keep it up. Uh, and for us, I just want to finish with this takeaway for us that we might put this into practice. You know, keep it simple. Prayer really should be the most natural thing in the world. So. It shouldn't come across as complicated, intense or weird. And when Jesus is asked by his disciples how to pray, this is what he says. This is Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. And again, it's from the message version of the Bible. Jesus says, find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply, as honestly as you can manage. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with, and he knows better than, than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply. So God invites you to pray anywhere, take a walk in the rain, rap, be silent in the woods, go for a run until you sense God's smile if you're able, throw yourself down a water slide yelling hallelujah if that's your thing, but keep it simple. So keep it simple and then keep it real. In this same passage I read earlier, Jesus is speaking. He goes on to say, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, he says, And when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Jesus says, keep it real. Don't pretend. See, often the Bible is way more honest than the church. Uh, the pain and the, the disappointment and often unanswered prayer. So the Bible may not be happy, clappy, but it's deeply honest. On one occasion, Jesus tells a story about a Pharisee and a tax collector. Uh, and I can imagine that in this crowd, as Jesus is telling this story, there's probably a number of Pharisees standing there. And probably also over this side, maybe a group of people who know that they are terrible prayers. They think they're rubbish. And as Jesus tells this story, I can imagine this like a little twinkle in his eye. And the Pharisee prays this so clever, all high and mighty words and all the right prayers. Oh, thank you, God, that I'm not like other men. And then there's the tax collector who is despised and feels as if he's no good at all before God and he's rocking backwards and forwards as he prays I'm a sinner I'm a sinner before God I can imagine Jesus he kind of winks at the Pharisee and says which of these two went home heard by the father Jesus is saying J just be honest be real before God so keep it simple keep it real and thirdly, keep it up. I don't know about you, but sometimes I wonder, are, are my prayers making a difference? Are they getting through? Are they being heard? Sometimes I just, I just can't seem to pray anything. Maybe I'm in the midst of this crisis. I, I, I feel so overwhelmed. Where do I start? And I mumble a few words. And maybe this little clip here describes something of your prayer life.
I love that. It, isn't the amazing thing about God that he takes our messy, honest and garbled prayers. He knows what's gone on in our day and takes our prayers and interprets our prayers. And it's exactly what we get from this wonderful verse uh, in Romans chapter 8 verse 26, which, which says this, it says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. I love that. It's not about getting all the words right. It's about the heart. So we've seen that if we choose to pray as part of the people of God in a posture of humility, it starts with a decision. It's a choice. Now, I know that as someone who struggles with a lot of any sense of self-discipline, attending a gym or saying no to chocolate cake or ringing the wider family regularly or even shaving daily at the moment as we're in lock-in, I would hesitate to advocate a time to pray, a regular ongoing part of prayer. And I, don't, I don't really don't want to put anything that's not sustainable or heavy on you as you seek to grow in prayer, particularly maybe if you've got young children at this time and it's just so hard, it's tough. But there is this great and inescapable truth that's taught in scripture and modelled by Jesus and advocated without exception by all the heroes of faith that you cannot grow in prayer without some measure of effort and discomfort, self-discipline and even self-denial. Just as we cannot get physically fit without regular exercise and a healthy diet, so your spiritual growth will be determined by the prayer that you exercise. You need to choose. So whether maybe you put into practice that Unite 714, praying at 714 a.m. and 714 p.m. for one minute. Or maybe, like uh, some of us, are using Lectio 365 on your phone, a simple uh, app, which is really good. You can listen to it or read it. Again, it's not very long, but it's a daily way to help you pray. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, next week we will discover that God says, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. And what we're going to do now is pray as Chelsea leads us through this verse, praying for our nation, for our church, that God would break in. Let's do that now. Good morning, St Andrews. I hope you're keeping well. Um, I'm going to be doing the prayers for this morning, so let us pray. Lord, we are your people, made in your likeness, formed in our mother's womb, our names carved into your palms. Our sin paid for, our position as heirs to the kingdom bought at the highest price. We named ourselves for your son, the Christ. Lord, we search for you, we seek your face. We know we have sinned, turned away, forgotten your gift of love for us. But don't forget us. Give us what we don't deserve. Grace, mercy, forgiveness. Let us see what true love looks like so it changes us, changes us profoundly to the depths of our soul. Let us use this time of lockdown to turn and run towards you. Grab that torch of hope you give us and pass it on. For a light has shone in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. May this time of testing unite communities, build faith and change our priorities. We do not want to go back to how things were before. We want to move forwards into your kingdom here and now. Lord, call your people, your church, to rise up and be counted. To show the reason for our faith and not hide in the crowd trying to blend in. Teach us to love as you have loved us, generously, indiscriminately and ceaselessly without condition, 
or selfish motive. Let this be the start of a revival that will go down in history. Let your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. God bless. Well, what we're going to do now as a church family, wherever you are, is to share in communion. So if you've not got your uh, bread or your wine or juice, whatever you're going to use, then do take uh, some time now just to go and get that ready. So you can join us as we do this together. As we uh, read in the Bible, it was very much that communion was part of taking uh, the bread and wine as part of a normal meal in the homes. And I think over the years, uh, the church has kind of absorbed that into the service. But actually, what we read in the Bible is very much part of uh, doing this in the home. So what we do now in the different homes that we are a part of, we are doing what the Bible pattern was to join in and to share in remembering Jesus' death on that cross. So we're going to do that as we gather together. And um, this is what we read in scripture it says that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me uh, and in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we're going to say the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Uh, and Debbie's going to lead us, but it's on the screen in front of you. Do join in as we say this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Uh, though we are many. We are one body because we all share in one bread. Now before we uh, take bread and the wine, I'm just going to invite us in the quiet of your own home uh, just to, before God, confess or say sorry or put uh, anything right with God that you need to at this moment. So let's just be quiet for a few moments and say, Lord God, are there, is there anything in my life that I need to put myself right with you? Are there things that I need to say sorry for this week between the person that I'm living with at the moment or staying with or someone I know I need to just confess and say sorry to you for? to encourage you now if you're on your own to take that bread and wine and to eat and to drink that if you're with others in your home do share it with others as we're going to do that now Debbie the body of Christ keep you in eternal life Amen the body of Christ keep you in eternal life Amen May the blood of Christ, uh, shed, may the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Debbie. Amen. Simon, the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. So as we have shared together in bread and wine we say father thank you for what you have given us in jesus 
through his death and his resurrection, we are made one with you. Uh, we're going to sing together now as we uh, worship uh, and celebrate all that God has done. And then after that, we'll have a chance to pray and to have God's blessing on us as we go from here. Let's worship. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer And oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not care joining us this morning we hope that you've met with God through this service as we've met together online we're just going to pray now and ask God that he would bless us as we um, continue on living our lives with him through this crisis we find ourselves in so the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace amen Amen. So, if you want to join us now on Zoom, you can do that. You can see at the bottom of the page there should be a link to join us. Um, or if you've got an email, it should have that in there to take you to Zoom. We'd love to see you and chat over coffee. Uh, do join one of the small groups that are happening throughout the week. It'd be lovely to see. There's far more information on our website. And we look forward to seeing you online next Sunday. Mm -hmm.